<laughs> Greetings, citizens. I am Toronto's greatest supervillain, Dr. Holocaust, and you are listening to Channel Awesome's podcast, Nerd to the Third Power. Hi everybody and welcome to Nerd to the Third Power, your one-stop shop for all things nerdy and awesome. I'm your host, Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Gonzo. With me as always is Epic Quest of Awesomeness, is our resident anime goddess, the cat. Cat, how you doing? I'm doing swell. How you doing? I'm doing alright, doing alright. Finished up my final exam, so I've got the next eight weeks off until fall semester starts up, so it is strictly sleep and Skyrim from now until then. So, yeah, I'm doing all right. And uh, in our other co-pilot's chair is a uh, resident English person, Skyblaze. Skyblaze, how you doing? Pretty good, apart from having to get up at stupid in the morning all this week. But I'm sure I'll survive. Yes, coffee is your friend. Triple caffeine, string caffe- espresso. Caffeine in general is my friend, yes. Do you, do you guys have over there, they, 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 they just started coming out uh, over here in the States, but they're like, they're caffeine candies. Yeah, do you have those over there? They're like these little fruit chews so. that are highly caffeinated. Don't think so. They're we have the like, like the little caffeine shots that you get, which are mostly disgusting. Okay, no, these are like these are like little like 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 caffeinated gummies. They're they're affronts to the laws of God and man, but goddamn, they'll wake you up in a hurry. That's really that's a bad idea because imagine a kid getting a hold of those, thinking that they're for like regular gummies. Uh, I... You know, I have a pack of these, and there's a four-year-old that lives underneath me. I'm just going to chuck him at my window one day, see if he picks them up and record the results. Well, he'll probably die. <laughs> because I'm an awful human being. Well, <laughs> goes without saying. <laughs> All right. And uh, we got a relatively full bench in our uh, correspondence corner. Brian and Brendan, how you guys doing? If you call two out of three a relatively full bench, then yeah, yeah, we're here, and I'm doing all right. How you doing, Brian? I'm exhausted. I spent all weekend uh, volunteering at my local uh, anime convention, San Japan, uh, helping out. So I've been sort of running around and doing all sorts of things. So I'm very, very tired, even though it's a couple days past. But I had fun. He's getting over con fatigue. I, le- I don't think I picked up any con flag- plague, knock on wood. I don't have any wood around me. Oh, no. <laughs> this is why you, you need might a real have desk. a problem there, sir. Okay, but uh, we got a fun show tonight. We're discussing the uh, documentary I Know That Voice, uh, produced by John DiMaggio, all about uh, the voice acting industry, so that's going to be fun. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to, to discussing that. So, But of course, there is procedure to follow. We cannot put the cart before the horse, so we shall start, as always, with Ask a Geek, and we got several questions here. Uh, first question here is from Gavin for Skyblaze. It says, I hear that in real-world sword fighting, you never attack at the edge part of the blade with the other edge, because it'll just chip the blade. But in most fo- films I see with a sword, they always do that. What do you think about this? Okay. Um, first of all, when you're talking about uh, swords that shouldn't be used edge to edge, um, which I suspect that what you've heard is probably in relation to katana. Now, katana, because the, of Japan having very little in the way of decent high-grade steel, uh, what they do have, they have to really be careful with in how much they use. So katana only have um, a tiny bit near the edge which is really high grade steel. Um, Because of this if you try and sharpen it too much uh, uh, after it gets a dent in it then you will shear away the high grade steel and the high grade steel is what keeps the incredibly sharp edge, the razor edge that katana are famous for. So with katana you always parry with the back of the blade, the, the blunt edge. Um, because you can't afford to uh, to sharpen the blade after it gets a ding in it. However, um, Western swords, well, Europe and America has 
iron and high grade steel coming out the wazoo. So we don't care. You know, you break your sword, you get a new one. Or the entirety of the sword is probably likely made of fairly decent high grade carbon steel. So you can take a whetstone and sharpen it down. Um, and it's not really a problem. So it depends on what type of fight it is. It does piss me off if people are fighting with um, katana and they're going edge to edge because that's wrong. Um, for starters, you would never really get a very long fight with katana anyway. Katana fights were supposed to start and finish with a single blow. However, um, when you're talking about saber, rapier, claymore, blacksword, longsword, broadsword, all of those western weapons, we really didn't care. You get it dinged, you spend the time sharpening it. And that's important for good sword care, by the way. If you get a ding in your blade, you sharpen it out. Because if you don't, if you're doing something like fencing, you can cause someone some serious damage. Uh, next question here uh, is from Zach, and it's for both me and Skyblaze, and he wants us to, to begin what I'm sure will be an eternal debate. What are better, guns or swords? Oh, ooh, hello. Ooh, 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 ooh. Can I jump in on this too? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, God, why, why? <laughs> if somebody says gun blades, I'm going to laugh. Oh, God, why? I will also laugh. I you know wasn't... they existed? They, they, they did, but not in the form that uh, all the Final Fantasy nerds uh, think they did. No. So, uh, Skyblaze, why, why, why don't you go first on this one? Uh, it depends what you're trying to do. Um, it also depends about what historical period you're talking about. Because if we go back to the era of, um, flintlocks, uh, for anything closer than, I think it's about 50 yards, you wanted a sword. Because you will get one shot off and it will probably miss. And in the time that the enemy has taken to, uh, that the, in the time that it takes you to reload the bloody pistol, your the enemy is probably right up in your uh, in your grill. So having pistols for volleys and suppressing fire is kind of useful, but you want a sword as backup. Um, modern days, frankly, if you're trying to kill someone, then you want a gun. The thing about a sword is that you, you need to know how to use it. And the thing about a gun is that for the most part you can pick it up and shoot someone and probably kill them fairly dead. Now, it's, it's kind of funny that uh, that you mentioned the, the, the gun-sword combination from the olden days. Um, I've actually got a friend whose uh, father works some kind of uh, some kind of uh, combat consultant for, uh, the, for the Department of Defense. And uh, he's actually... There's apparently a a small but vocal uh, section of people in his industry. Again, I, I don't know what you would call this industry, who are advocating uh, bringing back at least uh, shorter swords into combat use because of uh, in situations where a rifle would be a little too unwieldy in close combat. So a, a quick draw, maybe long knife, would be more useful. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting that uh, you bring that up. Uh, myself, I've just if we're just talking just in general usage. I've always been uh, more of a gun aficionado. I actually own a few. Um, I'll tell you this though. If there's one weapon that I would want to own it would be a Mateba Model 6 Unica Revolver. Um, which if you if you're at your computer right now go ahead and Google this thing. It is a badass looking pistol. Uh, and fun fact it's actually the gun that uh, the anime version of Trigun took design cues from for Vash's pistol. Uh, less so the Badlands Rumble or the manga, but uh, the anime version of Trigun's of, of, of Vash's revolver uh, actually took a lot of design cues from the Mateba Model Six. So that's that's and other than that, it's just a badass looking handgun, and I would love to own one, but they're rare as fuck. So okay, all right. Next question here uh, is uh, for all of us, and it's from uh, Tim, and he wants to know what our thoughts on the uh, upcoming Ninja Turtles movie are. Uh, we're doing an episode on that, so stay tuned. If if we could all just give a collective groan, <sighs> can, can we? <sighs> <laughs> that was surprisingly okay. musical. Well, congratulations, everyone! I enjoyed yeah. that. <laughs> give a collective groan in harmony. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I feel like I, I, I feel like I should just like grab a baton and do like a Leopold Straczynski <laughs> and just like conduct you as you groan. 
<laughs> you like the blue Danube and moaning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Next question is from Miguel, and uh, I'm presuming it's for all of us. Uh, we all know that one of the joys of being a geek is the collection. Is there anything in your respective collections that is the crown jewel uh, or something that you found out years later one of your items has become extremely sought after by other collectors? So, um, <laughs> Brian, let's start with you. I don't have any, uh, nothing comic-wise is, uh, well, not to my knowledge. I have so many long boxes I don't even really, really uh, remember what I have in terms of single issues. But I'll tell you that um, I have, I still have my Dreamcast, and I have a game called Project Justice, which was a, the sequel to, was a Project Justice? It was a sequel to Rival School, the Capcom 3D fighting game. And apparently, I didn't know this until much, much later, um, that one is now considered a pretty rare game and pretty sought after by a lot of people. Um, so much so, I'm not going to sell it. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Brendan, what about you? Um, well, I mean, I don't have any Power 9 sitting around at home, so in terms of stuff that's in the field of things I talk about on the show, really the only thing I could think of would be this one foil card, an epic experiment that I pulled during a tournament at a convention and went on to win some games with. That one really only has value to me, though, so I don't know that I'd call it the crown jewel of my collection. As for, you know, just general geekery stuff, though, I mean, call Sacrilege if you want, but I never really got into Skyrim all that much. However... The Alduin figure that came with my collector's edition of the game that sits atop my bureau, that I wouldn't give up for anything. Oh, I'm so jealous. All right, Kat, what about you? Crown jewel of your collection. Hmm, I collect a lot of different kinds of things, but I, I would say probably the thing that I'm most proud of owning that I show off on occasion is... Uh, from my collection of anime art books, and I have an art book for uh, Clamp's Tokyo Babylon manga. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous art book. It cost me a, a pretty penny, um, and, and it's completely, like, I don't know. I go to conventions, and I have only saw it the one time, and I've never seen it since. And, uh, and I just freaking love the hell out of Clamp, and I have lots of other art books, but this one is absolutely my favorite. Skyblaze, what about you? Crown jewel of your collection. Um, well, I have a, a couple. I have a Masterpiece Starscream and a Masterpiece Rodimus Prime. Um, the original Takara versions uh, in my toy cabinet, which I'm quite proud of. I have one. I have the uh, European exclusive box set for Sonic Generations. Um, but I suppose the thing that I'm like, uh, you will have to pry it from my cold dead hands is my copy of um, Sonic Adventure 2 for the Dreamcast, which was signed by Takashi Iozuka, Yuji Naka, and the members of Crush 40. What? Yep. Wow. Oh, that, oh that, 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 that's right. Brendan hasn't heard the joke yet, has he? There's a joke that goes with this? <laughs> oh, here we go. If any... If any, if anyone famous in geekdom has passed through England's borders, Skyblaze has met them. Uh, I, I don't Not remember exactly what episode true. it was, but if you go back through our backlog and find these, and find the sandwich, find the sandwich rant, that was where it reached its peak. <laughs> I think I invited you to uh, die in a bin at that point. <laughs> <laughs> a bin that was before also you, on fire. Before, before you sullenly admitted that you could not in any way argue with it. <laughs> Nah. Anyway, uh, crown crown jewel of my collection. Uh, oh man, I I think it would have to be the Magnavox Odyssey two, in box with like a dozen games. Uh, that old that old uh, Channel Awesome Hand Cold Guy gave me as a gift. Uh, when I'm when uh, I went with him to uh, Digital Press for one of the North American Video Game Aficionados meets. Uh, it still works. It's it's. Uh, I had it hooked up to a television, uh, but that was an old CRT uh, television, an old tube television. Uh, now that I've got my flat screen, I, it doesn't have an RF uh, connector, so I can't I can't play with it anymore. But it still works. It's still in the original box, and uh, outside of one of the cartridges being broken, everything is in perfect working order. You so know, uh, that's 
you know, you can, um, there are people on various places that actually do the, uh, the cables that convert it from RF to SCART. I'm, I'm sure there are people who, there are ways to convert it, but you, you also, you have to remember, I'm criminally lazy. So, and Fair very enough. poor. So, I have, I have neither the drive nor the means to, uh, to do it myself or have someone else do it. So... I figure I'll just be driving. I'll, I'll just wait until I'm driving along on, you know, one day and I see someone's throwing an old television out on the side of the street. Take it and hope that it works. <laughs> I, I hate to interrupt, so, but I'll, I just I'll, I just remembered something about this question. Something that I just got yeah? that could be considered a crown jewel. And I don't know how much it's sought after, but I know, in fact, it's rare because I've never seen it until I got it in my hands. Is that I recently got my hands on the last Starfighter combat game. I saw you. I saw the post you made about that. That's and that's it's com epic. It's, it's complete. Everything's in it. All the tiles are there. What? All the dice are there. Fuck. All the papers are there. Even the instructions are all there. I so, think you've just. I can hear our fans drooling <laughs> as you enumerate I, this. I or at least, I, or at least yeah. the ones who know what the hell he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, I, I didn't know this existed. Like my uh, my friend, tall Chris, he's like, "Hey, I, I found this. Do you want it?" I'm like, oh, "Yes!" And I punched him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I got too excited. Mine now, uh, run! <laughs> <laughs> that you just, you had a, you had a Willy Wonka moment because I've got a golden ticket. <laughs> run home! Run home! <laughs> Uh, that that that's that's about that's that's about what happened to me when a friend of mine uh, offered to uh, ask me if I wanted his uh, his his original first print copy of the Neverhood on PC. I was like, yeah, want it? You better give it to me before I kill you for it. <laughs> so okay, all right. Uh, one last uh, question here uh, from Marshall for everyone: What comic slash game slash manga slash whatever would you like to see made into a full time TV show or movie? Brian, let's start with you. Well, uh, do you remember the Phantom? I know Sci Fi tried to like reinvent him, and it was awful. And it came, it came out with like three episodes and got canceled. But I would love to see an old style Phantom TV show again. It has to be a period piece of the 1940s. That's what I would like to see. <laughs> okay, Cat, what about you? Um, I would like to see the the anime or the manga or the light novels or whatever of the story of Sai Koku as a J drama. Very specifically as a J-drama, not not in America or a movie. Okay. I'll just have to smile and nod at that one because I have no idea what you're talking about. All right, Brendan, what, what about you? Okay, well, um, the Yu-Gi-Oh card game spawn out of a TV series, and Magic the Gathering is already getting its own movie at some point in the future. So there's not really much for me to draw from here. So instead... I'm going to draw from Brian's domain and say that I'd like to see Marvel's Runaways comics get either a TV treatment or a movie of their own. It was a very interesting... Ooh. You know them? That's a good one. That, I, I love the Runaways. Are you kidding? That was one of my favorite books when I followed comics. God, I thought I was the only person who read them. No, no. C c continue, my brother. Speak. Preach. Oh, <laughs> Lord, no. Lord, no. It's it's a very interesting um, sort of not superhero story. It's, it's yeah, it's about a bunch of, well, teenagers who discover that their parents are, in fact, an evil crime syndicate, and they decide to fight back, so they steal some of their parents' tech and do just that. And once they defeat their parents, then the comic goes on to show their adventures in the wider world. A world which happens to contain people like, say, Iron Man. And Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. writers, if you're listening, do a Runaways episode. Oh, my God. I might need to change my Okay. Pants. Guy Blaze, what about you? Um, I would be very amused to see someone try and attempt uh, any of David Edding's books as a TV series or movie. So something like the Belgariad, uh, because he he was one of those writers who really hated television, so he deliberately made it kind of as in places as difficult as possible to film, just to say like just as a big fuck you. Uh, so that would be entertaining, um, or pretty much anything by Mercedes Lackey. Um, could be pretty good. 
The thing I'm really surprised about is nobody's actually done any of the Dragon Riders of Pern yet, considering how huge that has been over the years. Ooh, those might be good. Okay. Um, well, I'm sure I said this uh, when we did our Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode, but I would love to see a Thomas Jane-led uh, Punisher television series. Uh, you'd only be able to show it on like HBO or Showtime or, or one of those one of those shows that those networks that doesn't mind doing something a little extreme. But uh, a Thomas a Thomas Jane led Punisher TV series I think would be amazing. Because yeah, I'm pretty sure ABC presents the Punisher. That's not gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> well, stranger things have happened. Apparently, Joan and Vasquez is in talks with Disney to produce a television show for them. Bearing in mind, this is the same guy who wrote Invader Zim and Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. Yep. <laughs> this should be fun to watch. Oh, indeed, indeed. So, anyway, but that's all the Ask Geek questions that we have for this week. As always, you can send them to send them to us through the email at billysmith at channelawesome.com or drop them in the That Guy With Glasses forums in our Ask a Geek thread. Or uh, Producer Tom is also kindly uh, starting up threads on the Facebook for each week's uh, episode to take Ask a Geek questions. So that's another avenue uh, for you to drop your questions if you're following us on Facebook. So, yeah, one more reason to do so if you haven't already. And with that, uh, we've got a lot of show ahead, so we're going to jump right into our news headlines starting this week with Brian. So, Brian, take it away. Well, thank you. This week, the multiverse headlines may be a tad bit short because I was out the weekend helping out with San Japan. But that doesn't mean I didn't notice the big news that did come by. Last week, Marvel's Joe Quesada went on to the Colbert Report to make a big announcement concerning Captain America. Steve Rogers looks like he'll be feeling some big changes in Marvel, and his super soldier serums are having some unseen side effects with him, so he can no longer hold the shield. But in his place, Sam Wilson, the Falcon, will be taking up the mantle of Captain America. Well, this actually isn't news to me, where a lot of people have sort of been following around a lot of the headlines and teasers. This was sort of spoiled, if you remember my headlines from a couple weeks ago. But for those who don't, this was a really big announcement. Of course though, this was all leading to even more announcements. Like a new Iron Man title called Superior Iron Man written by Tom Taylor. And as always, this Iron Man will get himself a new suit, but it's still it's still Tony underneath it, don't worry. All of this leads into another Avengers team with the title of Avengers Now. That kind of go with the Now promotion they've been promoting for in the last couple of years. Marvel Now, and then all new Marvel Now, now we have Avengers Now. When? Soon. With a new female Thor, Sam as Captain America, and Superior Iron Man seems to be the main three, but other characters look on to take roles next year as they expand out, such characters like Ant-Man and Doctor Strange, which will have movies coming out. But also have the new Deathlock, which is connected to the S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show. Scarlet Witch will be making her film debut, and Angelina, who is actually now connected more to Thor and his family since being come over from Image Comics. There's also Into the Inhumans, which Marvel is still trying to push as sort of a substitute for the mutants that is sort of kind of controlled by another studio at the moment. Sad face. This is all pretty big news and still a little bit vague. Obviously, there's going to be some more news once San Diego Comic Con happens this week. In other more independent news, Gail Simone is looking to expand her reach into Dynamite Entertainment. She's currently writing a working title called The Women of Dynamite, which is going to be a crossover with Red Sonja, Vampirella, and Deja Thorne from John Carter of Mars fame. Not to be outdone, writer and huge John Carter fan Ron Mars is also going to be taking on John Carter in his own separate title coming out later this year. And in my last story, still sticking with Dynamite right now, we're looking into Masks. Now, Masks was actually a miniseries first written by Chris Robinson of last year. It was alright and got a little bit campy in the middle, but it was obviously successful enough as that there's going to be now a sequel to it, but this time written by Colin Byrne, who's you know as Deadpool and Magneto writer. Obviously, the titles and pulp heroes will all be coming back under a new name, and there's also going to be talking about a legendary escape artist, obviously Harry Houdini, will be added to the team. How are they going to add in an actual real person into the book mixed up with pulp heroes? Well, we'll have to wait for that to come out later this year. Well, 
that's all the time. I told you it was a little bit short this week for the multiverse headlines, so I'm going to turn it right over now to Brendan for some tabletop gaming news. Brendan, take it away. Thanks, Brian, and to everyone else, welcome. As you've probably figured out by now, this is Brendan the Blast Seeker, and I'm here with your regularly scheduled summary of the state of play in the tabletop world. We've got an awful lot of information to cover, and only a few turns to do it in, so without, I'm afraid, any ado whatsoever, here is the current board position for all of your favorite gaming needs that don't come with a power cord. I'm telling you guys, I just can't win when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! these days. Last episode, I was really anxious to get the information on the new Forbidden and Limited lists out because it had actually already gone into effect by the time I reported on it. Now I find out that in my rush to get that into your hands, not only did I miss the boat on the official release of the new Super Starter, featuring the brand new Pendulum Summon mechanic, but that Pendulum Monsters are now officially legal for tournament play too? Well, if Konami Digital Entertainment set out to make me look like a fool... Yeah, 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 they kind of did succeed, but that's as far as they'll get. So, in the spirit of playing catch-up, we're covering both Pendulum Monsters as a whole and the space-time Super Starters particulars right here, right now. It would probably make the most sense if we started by breaking down the mechanics of Pendulum Monsters. A Pendulum Monster has an attack score, a defense score, a type, and a level, just like almost any other monster. Unlike almost any other monster, it also has two text boxes with different effects, and which effect you get to use depends on where you play it. You have two options in that regard. First, you can normal summon your pendulum monster to any of the five monster card zones on your side of the field. In that case, its controller applies the bottommost text box to the monster, defining its type, attack, defense, and effect, if it has one, and not all of them do. All the normal rules for summoning apply, so you can only do this once per turn by default, only on your turn during a main phase, and if it's level 5 or higher, you'll need to offer the appropriate amount of tributes before you can play it. The second option is where things start to get interesting. In only the second ever change to Yu-Gi-Oh!'s playing field, the first being the addition of the Banishment Zone, two new card zones have been added, one at the extreme left and extreme right of each player's side of the field. Instead of playing your Pendulum Monster as a regular monster, you can instead play it in one of these two zones. In that case, its controller applies the topmost text box, which causes your Pendulum Monster to behave more like a continuous spell card and grant you an effect for as long as it's there. That effect can be anything from a triggered effect that responds to something you or your opponent does, to an activated effect that requires you to pay some sort of cost in order to turn it on, to a static effect that is always running no matter what you or your opponent are doing. Playing a Pendulum Monster in this way also changes the rules baggage associated with it. When sending a Pendulum Monster to one of these zones, its controller sets off a chain, like you would if you were actually playing a spell card, and that chain must resolve before the monster can actually reach the Pendulum Zone. Once in the Pendulum Zone, it's treated by the game as a spell card, making it vulnerable to the same removal cards and effects that can target regular spell cards. That's also the only way your Pendulum Monster will ever leave the Pendulum Zone, as once it's there, you cannot remove it except through the effect of another card. There's one more important thing to note before we move on, and that is that Pendulum Monsters, despite being destroyed by all the same things that destroy other monsters, don't go to the same place they do after they're destroyed. Instead, a destroyed Pendulum Monster is sent to the extra deck for the duration of the duel. This only occurs if the Pendulum Monster would be sent to the graveyard from the playing field, but it happens no matter where on the playing field it was sent from, be it Monster Zone or Pendulum Zone. Banishment and effects to send cards back to the hand or deck will function normally against Pendulum Monsters. Now, here comes the part that's kinda scary. Pendulum Monsters bring with them a new action you can take during your main phase called Pendulum Summoning. In addition to having two text boxes, all Pendulum Monsters have a pair of indicators on either side of the card that each line up with one of the two Pendulum Zones. During one of your main phases, if you have a monster in each of your Pendulum Zones, you can declare a Pendulum Summon, then check those indicators. The numbers from the left indicator on the card in the left side zone and the right indicator on the card in the right side zone will create a small range of numbers. 
a range from which you may then special summon as many monsters from your hand and as many pendulum monsters from your extra deck as you wish, provided that their levels are all within the range defined by the cards in your pendulum zones. For example, if I have no monsters on the field, but two pendulum cards in play, with the left zone set to three and the right zone showing a seven, I can pendulum summon the two level four monsters in my hand along with the level 5 and level 6 Pendulum Monsters waiting in my extra deck, but not the level 8 monster that just also happened to be sitting in my hand at the time. There are, of course, some additional rules that go with Pendulum Summoning. As has already been mentioned, you can only Pendulum Summon during one of your own main phases, and even then, only once per turn. Like normal summoning or setting a monster, Pendulum Summoning Monsters is treated as a game action that resolves immediately and not as part of a chain, although the monsters themselves can be responded to with traps, spells, and monster effects as normal. Pendulum Summoning also obeys all card-specific summoning restrictions, so any monsters that need to be summoned in special ways, like Dark Armed Dragon, Black Luster Soldier, or any kind of ritual monster, cannot be cheated out with a Pendulum Summon. Nonetheless, from my perspective, the addition of Pendulum Summoning to the game appears to be a calculated move to encourage big plays and even bigger swings in momentum. The complete unlimiting of Mirror Force makes a lot more sense in this context, as I imagine it will be a universal staple if Pendulum Summoning takes off to the degree that Konami appears to be pushing it to. Even three Mirror Forces do little to quiet the dread I feel, though, at the prospect of a way to summon game-ending legions of doom from nowhere in a way that's easier than ever. I know that was a lot of information to take in, but try to stick with me just a little longer and I'll tell you how you can get in on all this new stuff. Starting on July 14th, Konami Digital Entertainment released their latest Yu-Gi-Oh! Superstarter, intended for easing new players into the game as a whole, and getting veteran duelists accustomed to the newest cards and mechanics. This year's model is called the Space-Time Showdown, and the box it comes in contains a few different pieces that deserve explanation. First of all, there's the deck itself, which contains the minimum 40 cards required for organized play. Of those cards, 26 are reprints, 8 normal monsters of varying levels and power, 8 spells, likewise varying from extremely useful to, well, poison of the old man, and 10 very useful traps, with the only remotely questionable choice being Shadow Spell, in my opinion. The other 14 cards are all new, and 12 of those 14 are effect monsters. Two of those are super rare Pendulum monsters, the only ones available until the release of Duelist Alliance in mid-August. The other 10 are a themed set of four empowered warriors, an empowering dragon, and five spellcaster type summoners, which produce similar effects to the empowered ones each of them mimics. The remaining two new cards are a continuous spell and a field spell that do interesting things, but nothing terribly novel. There are, of course, also contained within the box, a simplified beginner's guide offering up a means for new players to figure out what's going on, but more relevant is the updated playmat with pendulum zones included, a concept everyone might need help getting used to. Once you're done playing with all of that, though, there's still something else to mess with. Like other superstarters before it, Space Time Showdown also contains two semi-random five-card power-up packs consisting of cards intended to be useful when you inevitably customize or dismantle this deck. The reason they're semi-random is because one card in each of the packs is guaranteed to be an ultra-rare version of one specific card. In this case, opening your two packs will always net you a Dark Hole and an Odd Eyes Dragon. The other cards in the packs will be drawn at random from a 15-card pool, which contains stuff like Reinforcement of the Army and Mirror Force. Hmm. Why do those sound familiar? Anyway, that's it for the contents of the regular Superstarter, but because nothing in life is ever simple, there's also a Superstarter power box that adds an additional power-up pack, this one completely randomized, and a rubberized version of the new playmat, so you can take it with you to every tournament and completely fail to impress anyone, and all in exchange for a price hike. I wish I could say a modest price hike, but honestly, it's probably not worth it. If the Space Time Showdown Superstarter sounds like something you want, I'd advise you go for the base model, which retails for about 13 US dollars, rather than the power box at 20 dollars. And despite all of that, I still have stuff left on the list that I need to tell you. 
I'll try to keep this brief. In addition to the massive addition that was Pendulum Monsters, Konami made two small rules changes that might actually make a big impact of their own. For one thing, duelists are now allowed a maximum of one active field spell card of their own at a time. This replaces the rule that limited field spells to one overall for both players. You may still replace your existing field spell card by sending it to the graveyard as you play a new one, but your opponent's field spell will be unaffected. Card effects that destroy or otherwise interact with field spells will still function as normal. The only difference is that now both of you get to have one. It's the other rules change that has me curious to see how it turns out. In addition to not being able to conduct a battle phase, the first player to move during a duel will no longer be allowed to draw a card during their draw step. This has historically been a big difference between Yu-Gi-Oh! and other card games like Magic, and the result was often a disadvantage in resources and momentum that favored the player who went first. Taking away that first draw creates a much more level playing field, as well as an actual choice at the match's start. Go first and play your cards mostly unimpeded, or go second and have more means with which to respond. This development may seem somewhat dissonant given the very nature of Pendulum Monsters, but upon further introspection, Konami seems to be engineering a game not altogether different from Mario Kart, where big flashy moves are frequent and easy, and anyone can win at any time regardless of apparent skill level. That could be good, that could be horrible. Either way, none of us are in any position to call it yet, so we'll just have to wait and see. Rest assured though, I intend to keep an eye on this going forward. Guy Blaze? The recording booth is this way. Why are you going to the armory? Why are you- No, 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 stop, 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 stop! <sighs> it looks like Skyblaze got tired of waiting for her turn and decided to take matters into her own, unfortunately for me, very capable hands. Before I go stop her from doing something that will require the presence of the authorities, though, please let me take a moment to ask, as always, for your opinions. What did I miss or skim over that you would have rather heard more about? Alternatively, should I go back to yakking about magic for once? Kindly direct your comments, concerns, and vitriol to our Facebook page or to my own personal address for N-Cubed Correspondence, blastseeker at nerdtothethirdpower.com, and I promise you I will not ignore it completely. So, until next session, this is Blastseeker Brendan reminding you that while gigantic dumbass space armies from nowhere may be your enemies, the dice are always your friends. Skyblaze, there you are! Put the damn rapier down and get in this booth! Well, I've covered most of the important points about surviving a convention as an attendee, but after this discussion topic last week, I'd feel a bit remiss if I didn't also cover some tips about surviving as a convention organiser. So, here we go. Number one, get experience. The best way to learn how to be an effective con runner is to go to loads of cons and volunteer at them. Chat to the con committees, make notes of what worked and what didn't. This does take time, because no one with any sanity can go from never having run an event before to trying to run a successful convention. Trust me, people have tried. It didn't go well. Number two, recruit the best. As you worm your way into the inner circles of con running, You'll quickly discover that the names of people who have a reputation on the con circuit for being excellent at a given role. Chat to them, get the benefits of their wisdom and experience, and if possible, and you're comfortable with doing so, recruit them to your cause. These old hands are the best way of ensuring you avoid the many pitfalls first time conventions can run into. Number three, get a detailed budget. I really can't stress this one enough. Get someone with experience with either the financial sector or someone who has run the financials for a successful convention in the past. Ideally both. Keep detailed specific accounts and get receipts for everything, and I do mean everything. You need someone who knows all the laws in this area because they are twisty and labyrinthine, and there are some very nasty pitfalls out there who aren't very careful in this area. You really don't want to get caught out. Number four, start small. It's far, far better to start off by selling out a tiny venue 
than to have a very small amount of people rattling inside around a huge venue. Summer of Sonic, for example, started out with a couple of hundred people at a tiny theatre in a uh, tiny theatre in London. These days, it has to use some of the biggest convention halls in London, and sells out tickets in under a minute. It did take them years to get that way, though, so be patient. Number five, never panic. No matter what happens, before, at, or after the event, never panic. Communicate with your attendees, keep them updated, reassure them that steps are being taken, talk to your fellow organisers, form a plan, follow the plan. I've known conventions that have had the venue roof blow off, or had half the electronic equipment stolen, or had the main fall flooded out, and yet still somehow managed to be relatively successful and have people enjoy themselves. It can be done, folks. Number six, communication. This is possibly the most important aspect of con running. Communicate. Communicate with your attendees, communicate with your fellow con runners, the venue, the vendors, the guests. Communicate with everyone. Email, text, telephone, Skype, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr. There is no excuse in today's society for not keeping in touch. Even if it's just a weekly or monthly check-in to let people know that things are proceeding as planned. Ideally, it's good to have a milestone set up to let people know when you've reached it. For example, when you've got the venue set up, have a milestone. Also, always respond to questions from attendees, even if they seem silly or pointless. A reputation for being friendly and approachable will help you in the long run. Well, I think that's enough for now. More on convention running next week. Over to you, Kat. Well, I'm going to start us on some sad news. DVD producer Richard Nobodo Kekahuna announced on the Anime News Network forums that DVD menu designer Catherine Schroeder passed away last week after a long battle with cancer. Schroeder designed screen menus for Zegapain, The Great Horror Family, Bloodhound, and Tour the Terra. She's also credited as the brainchild behind the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya American SOS Brigade marketing campaign and the website's hidden Easter eggs. She was in her 30s. Less tragic but still kind of regrettable news, it looks like the live-action Hollywood adaptation of Akira is back underway. Screenwriter Dante Harper, first writer of The Edge of Tomorrow screenplay, is reportedly working with Warner Brothers, Appian Way, and director Jean Colette Serra on beating this stalled film back into life. No other news aside from that on the project. There's also news reporting that Goodwill Hunting and Milk director Gus Van Sant is set to direct Warner Brothers' other live-action project we wish would just go away, the planned adaptation of Death Note. If you're like me, you get a little afraid every time there's new development around one of these live-action ventures, but as per usual, we're just gonna have to wait and see. Viz's weekly Shonen Jump digital magazine is serializing Watsuki Nobuhiro's Roroni Kenshin spin-off manga, controlling flame Roroni Kenshin hidden chapter. The two-part spin-off details the meeting of villain Shishio and lover Yumi. The first chapter ran last week, and the final chapter will run next month. This is nice because we don't always get the spin-offs here in the US, and even if it's digital only, it's pretty cool. Merchandising company Great Eastern Entertainment, a licensed distributor of anime and video game franchises, has filed a lawsuit against proprietor of the Maryland anime store along with 10 other unnamed defendants for selling bootlegs. Specifically, they're accused of trademark infringement, false advertising, unfair competition, deceptive trade practices, and consumer fraud. Great Eastern alleges that the 10 unnamed suspects create, sell, and supply Naomi and her business, which has the alternate name VK3388, with counterfeit merchandise. The lawsuit suit came about when an Aniplex of America representative found bootleg merchandise with Great Eastern's logo at their booth at Anime Central back in May. The convention issued a citation requiring them to stop or face ejection from the con, which one of the Maryland anime staffers signed, thus agreeing to. Great Eastern is requesting a jury trial and an award of damages, though I don't know yet if any court date has been set. We don't hear too often about these kinds of lawsuits because generally license holders don't have the time and money to apply towards a trial. But it looks like Maryland anime pretty well shot itself in the foot signing a legal agreement, so the case is probably stronger than usual. And finally, a little bit of J-pop news, Chage of the Chage and Asuka music duo is officially moving on following Asuka's arrest and drug charges from earlier this year. Asuka was released on bail on July 3rd, but it looks like there won't be a tearful reunion of the group. Chage announced on his personal blog that he formed a new band called 1-6, which will include multi-max vocalist and guitarist Murakami Keisuke, guitarist Nishikawa Susumu, vocalist Hisamatsu Fumina, drummer Sato Kyoichi, keyboardist Chikaraishi Rie, and bassist Takehiro Kojima. So he went from a two-man group to a freaking sports team? Seriously, that's a lot more people! 
Though I don't know if they've released any music yet, 1 slash 6 will go on tour starting in September. Best of luck to them in their new venture. And that's all I've got going on in the anime and manga and occasionally J-pop world. Over to you, Dr. Gonzo. Alright, thank you Kat. Our top story tonight, the British government has made a somewhat unusual move, decriminalizing video game piracy. While piracy will still technically be illegal in Great Britain, starting in 2015, the most action that a software pirate will have to face will be a sternly worded letter. This measure is part of what has been called the Voluntary Copyright Alert Program, and it is the result of a coalition between ISPs, British politicians, and the music and movie industries. One thing is for certain, you damn well aren't going to see this kind of thing in the States, where slamming dumb teenagers with $250,000 lawsuits is still a thriving industry. Hyrule Warriors is getting a few more faces added to its roster. This time around, Ocarina of Time's Sheik, Darunia, and Princess Rudo are being announced as getting turns at bat in the upcoming Dynasty Warriors slash Zelda mashup, which is due for worldwide release in September. And finally, in the, well, duh, department, Microsoft has released a statement showing that sales of the Xbox One have doubled in the U.S., coinciding with the release of a console package that came without the Kinect for about $100 less than the original package. You see, Microsoft? You see the good things happen to you when you listen to your customers? And, uh, well, that's about all it this week. We're in the middle of the summer lull, people, so hopefully things will pick up in the industry soon. And that's all the headlines we have for this week. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I know that voice, the John DiMaggio Helm documentary about the voice acting industry. So stay tuned. we got a lot of fun stuff ahead.
right, and we are back. And uh, this week, uh, we're discussing something that uh, Brian put together for us, uh, a documentary by John DiMaggio, uh, known to many of us as the voice of Bender in Futurama and Marcus Phoenix in Gears of War. Uh, he put together a documentary all about voice acting. And uh, we all thought that it'd be uh, fun to discuss. So, uh, yeah, I know that voice. So, uh, Brian, since you're the one who put this up to us, uh, why don't you give us a, a brief rundown, give our listeners a brief rundown of the film? Well, what's this little history behind this film is that this is actually something John DiMaggio has been putting together for years now. I think it, the the original idea came to him about maybe 2009 or so, and then it took him a while to sort of start getting everything rolling. Um, it's several years of interviews and talking to people, and before it finally get it, got released, I say released, quote unquote, last year November. Um, I believe around on iTunes only. It's only now sort of started to spread out into other venues to watch. But he got the idea basically, and he talks about it, is that he just wanted to have something to show people to kind of what the industry is about and what people what they do and sort of different techniques and things like that. So to get to give information, because here we are, you know, in 2014, and I feel like even now, even though there is sort of respect for the voice actors, especially among the, I guess, geek community and the nerd culture and things like that, they, st I feel like the industry still doesn't get enough respect like it should. And now to have something sort of physical, so when people go, well, what is voice acting? You go, ha ha ha, here, watch this. And you get this idea, because all it is, it's just voice actors talking to voice actors talking to voice actors talking to you. And so it's, it literally does the conversations you sort of watch in the film itself. It's they go through and they just a question's asked and you sort of get different responses out from the different actors that they, you know, and friends mostly, friends and peers. And what's also very cool is I didn't know this at the time, but when I watched it is they also got directors involved and then agents were also talked about as well and historians. So you get really a good full all roundabout look about this industry that's actually been around for many a decade, starting starting about in the radio era, technically. The first voice actors were radio actors, when you think about it. Okay. So now, Kat, as someone who has worked with voice actors and done a bit of voice acting uh, herself, uh, what were your uh, general thoughts on the film and the image it presents of the industry? Well, let me be very clear. This is a documentary about the American cartoon voice acting industry, more so than they briefly mention it, but I have always been way more into the anime voice acting industry, and it's a totally, totally different thing. Um, that being said, this was actually an incredible, incredible thing. I really, really enjoyed getting to, I keep doubling my words, really, really, really. Um. <laughs> That's called emphasis. It, it, it's it's called I don't like being put on the spotlight and I can't make the the mouth sounds. I can't do the talking thing. <laughs> um, you picked the wrong line of work then. I know it's terrible. <laughs> um, this was a great kind of documentary about people who we all know them. We don't know that we know them, but we we look we all know them, and uh, we don't you know, maybe know their faces or know their names, but here's here's everything you could want to know about who they are and what they do. And it was really informational, really fun. Um, it, it was it was really awesome. I enjoyed it a lot. Okay. So um, I guess I guess before we start talking about the film itself, uh, let's let's sort of talk a little bit about ourselves here. What were some preconceptions that you guys might have had about the voice acting industry before you went in and and saw this film. So, uh, Brian, let, let, let's start with you on this one. There, there's always a misconception. I think even now, uh, nowadays, um, of the technology involved. Because when you think about, it, you think you when you listen to it, you're like, well, obviously they've done something there, or they sped something up, or they've dropped their voice down. But then as you sort of watch this and you're going through it and you see them just doing the voices in front of you, like in their living room, you're going, oh, there's no technology involved. This is just them. Now, some may have some, like Transformers, I know they probably computerized some of their voices, but for the most part, it's just them doing these voices. And when you see things like that, um, or you think of, when you think of animal voices, like obviously they have a sound bank. No, it's D. Bradley, it's D. Bradley Baker. Just him. 
<laughs> no, it it really is just yeah. him. Only him. <laughs> He's the only one who can do that shit. Either either him or Frank Welker. Yeah. <laughs> they have an animal. Who I was amazed was who I was amazed was not in this film. I'd have thought a, a big legend like him, they'd have, they'd have, he'd have been the first person to get tapped, but no. Actually, but well, no. I, there's a well. I have an answer for that. Actually, is that Frank, while being amazingly a nice person, he's also kind of private. So they might have asked him, and he kind of was like, eh, "No thanks, but no thanks, guys." And like, okay, that's cool. Like he's actually kind of a private guy. So he's the Bill Watterson of the voice acting world. A little bit. No, no, I've seen interviews with him before, and he's had he's he's done them uh, a couple of times, but they're very rare. <laughs> you have to catch him in the act. But no, D. Bradley Baker doing the pig noises that. That started out funny, and then and then swung into really? into horrifying, <laughs> and then back to funny, and then it, I'm just watching this. And I'm just like, eh, I'm not really sure what he's going for here. I think he's oh. actually now legitimately choking. That one, that that was that was the, 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 the creepiest part of the program for me, bar none. I mean, he 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 reached for that green thing over there that I thought was a glass of water, and I'm like, oh god, thank god, he's done. And then then I went, oh no, he he's just getting started. Oh. <sighs> His, his process is not beautiful, but the results are. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for reminding I don't know. me. I don't know, whether to be, I don't know whether to be terrified or strangely aroused. <laughs> <laughs> it's impressive is what it is. I was like, but, um, how, how do you make those sounds? Actually, don't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll I tell you a, a misconception that I uh, always kind of had about the indus- about uh, the voice acting industry. And that was, uh, excuse me, I didn't think that it was as involved a process uh, as I, as, as the, the film presented. I always thought that it was, I, I, I'm kind of shamefaced to say this, actually. Uh, I always kind of thought that it was, you go in and you make funny voices for an hour and you get paid money afterwards. I didn't, it wasn't until I saw this film that I really got a, an impression of how, involved and how mental a process this really is um so i was really and again this 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 leads back to d bradley baker making the 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 pig fucking noises i didn't realize just again i didn't realize just how much of a process it truly was and how much thought and and exercise i guess for lack of a better term went into it so uh okay uh well, Kat, you've worked in voice acting before, so I guess you didn't have any preconceptions, but I'll, um, I'll forward I, the question I, to you anyway. I could, uh, I could uh, say that, uh, because because I, I really, my forte is knowing stuff about the anime industry, um, and this is a whole different beast. Um, kind of, maybe I'll say two things. Um, because of the way the anime industry works, I never really pictured the American cartoon industry having, um, like, big group recording sessions, because you just don't do that in, in the American anime industry. Um, and, and so, I, I guess at some level I knew it happened, but it was when they were actually showing, uh, I mean, I don't even know what it was for, if it was, like, a recording session for, for Futurama, or I don't know what it was, but... But just seeing all of those people in their own little separate sound booths, but all still like recording at the same time was really very, very cool. And I just never really was able to picture in my head how it worked. Like, I didn't know if they'd all be in a room together, but no, each in a separate booth, but all recording at the same time and they can all hear each other. I thought that was really cool. And then uh, the other thing I I kind of didn't really realize was how many people um, who were kind of pioneers of the industry were still part of the industry? How many people have been in the industry for like 50 years, 60 years? Some of these people, like they were, they had like the, 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 the lady who played on the, she played on the Jetsons is still in the industry. Some of these people have been around for a very long time and are still going at it. June Foray, Rocket J Squirrel, 95, still working. 95. It, like, watching her interview, you're like, she can barely talk. But as soon as she puts a character voice on, Jesus. <laughs> okay. Brendan, what about you? What were, what were some uh, preconceptions you had about, about the voice acting industry before going into this film? Well, I, I just... I'm not certain what I can say on that front because, I mean, while I didn't have a whole lot of preconceptions, that's because probably I just didn't really know a whole lot about it concretely. 
in the forms of geekery in which I indulge that involve power chords, most of those also involve voice acting in some way, shape, or form. And I was aware that voice acting was involved to the degree that I was aware that those animated things on the screen were really not talking of their own volition. There were people somewhere else providing the voices for those things. How the process worked beyond that, I really didn't know. One thing that did surprise me, though, I will admit, watching this documentary, was the level of, of, of preparation that these actors put into what they do and basically how ready they have to be to do almost anything on a second's notice. Like, especially for video games, these voice actors end up acting literally every single possible line in the game that the player could think of and then a few more beyond that. So that's that's an awful, awful, awful lot of work. And in everything else, you have to be flexible enough to do, you know, basically whatever the job demands, and the job can demand just about anything. Yeah, that was that. That, that, that takes me back to I, I, again. I never understood how involved the process was. Like at one point, I think Charlie Adler is talking about like you have to warm up your voice before you go in and do a recording and he's talking about how like he sings on his way to work and he sings on his as he's leaving to you know bring his voice to sort of stretch out his vocal cords and I was like I, I would never have even thought of that uh, until I saw this so I never even realized that that was an issue yeah so it was it's the same as singing you have to warm up because you're gonna abuse it and then you're gonna get vocal like nodes and all this other shit that can happen if you don't warm up properly it's a big deal and they're talking about like the musicality of the performance. How you're you're almost like how one of the things that a lot of voice actors do is like they'll almost sing the character's lines to get a, a, the the character's rhythm down. And I'm just like, wow, I never, I never imagined, like I never thought that, that was a thing. It, that, that's all totally new to me. That a was another layer of was... preparation that yeah, that I had no idea was was even going on. I mean. You're right. When when we de- when we dissect, um, you know, people's cadences, there is a sort of musicality, but you you never really think about it until, like voice actors are, you're asked to reconstruct it. And a lot of it is because I think, for the longest period of time, we would we would we never would put voice actor and slash and actor in like the same sort of area. But if anyone's ever done theater or any sort of drama or any sort of acting, and you sort of watch this. It's not different. The only, the biggest difference is that you're using your voice as a, a command and as your sort of acting tool, because you have to put your voice into this character, bring it to life, and whatever this character is feeling, you have to make sure you feel it through that voice. So, the cool, the coolest thing is that we, you now sort of see with with this uh, documentary is that this is a complete different level of acting. You know, you can actually kind of you can kind of convince people now that no, it's not just doing silly voices. This is there's acting involved in this. This is something that you know you have to sit down, and think about real quick, and sort of stay on to it. And the cool part about especially those warm ups, when you talk, when you watch it, there's no there's no right way to do it. Everyone sort of has their own style and niche to put it together, and it sort of works for it, what they do. So there's not sort of someone coming in going, well, I warm up this way, and someone pointing going, well, that's stupid. No, it's like, well, I warm up this way. Oh, that's kind of neat. You know, I warm up this way. That's cool as well. Um, you know, I cool down this way. Um, I wouldn't sing because I'm a terrible singer, so I'm not sure if that would warm up my voice. It might just ruin it. <laughs> i tell you something, something that I thought was really fascinating. Uh, I don't know if I ever mentioned this in the show, but I'm a big fan of classic uh, old-school uh, cartoons from, like, the 30s and the 40s, like the really old-school Looney Tunes and Woody Woodpecker cartoons. So that bit where they're talking about Mel Blanc and all the voices that he did and how, you know, he, he they're talking about the argument between Bugs and Daffy hunting season, rabbit season, how, you know, he wasn't just swapping the voice. He was actually doing Bugs Bunny, doing an impression of Daffy Duck, and I thought that was just completely fascinating. Um, and I also gained a lot of respect for the man when they got to the point where they talked about how he was in a co- he was in an accident that put him in a coma, and uh, he broke nearly every bone in his body. And he actually recorded he actually kept working from his hospital bed. I think there, uh, there I should thought be major, that was just the coolest there thing. There should be the major props. Here. There should definitely be uh, major props for the other actors though, because they said you replace them, and they all went, "No, we'll just wait. We're not replacing him." <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we we can we can be patient. <laughs> Let him heal. Because <laughs> think about that. Almost ne you, any any time that you would see something that happened other way, someone's like, "Yes, I'm going to jump into this chair and now I make all the money." No, everyone there's like, "No, no, no, no." We have we'll wait, we'll wait. It's all right. <laughs> you no, know, you know, that's Mel's chair. <laughs> yeah. Get it the fuck out of there. We will wait. <laughs> Yeah. If Muhammad won't come to the mountain, the mountain will go to Muhammad. By any so, means necessary. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it was, I don't know, it, it was just very, a very informative uh, documentary just all around. Um, and I, I loved how, I, how, especially how thorough it was. There, there was almost no ground that they left untouched. Um, you know, radio, uh, you know, cartoons, video games. They, although I... I'm, I'm kind of. I have to side with Cat on this one. They did kind of just brush over uh, anime uh, voice acting, which I thought was kind of like, well, oh, oh no, wait a minute. I I have friends who've worked in this field. They, I'm sure they would have things to say about this. Yeah, th it, I, it, I will it's a completely different industry. That's that's the only way to look at it. Is that there there is there's some people who you know dabble in both, but it's a completely different beast. You you can't oh. like it would take a whole other documentary. Well, it's because of the, the, the differences in the ways they're produced, right? Anime is, you know, animated over in Japan with Japanese voices and then brought over here to be redubbed. With the voice actors who were doing the bulk of the work we saw in the documentary, first they do the voice work, and then the animation is done around their voice with, you know, some tweaking back and forth as necessary. Right. So when we bring it over to the U.S., we have to go, well, now we have to take everything that they just said, put it into our language, and then make it fit those exact same number of lip flaps. So every time that mouth moves, you have to make you have to make everything that you want to say fit into that already predetermined mouth movement. And that's like the skill of the American voice actor for anime is to, to just say everything that you need to say in the very short amount of time that you have to say it. And it's... It's a skill. I also want to say, mention this real quick for, uh, is it Stephen, Stephen Bloom or Stephen, is it Stephen Bloom or Stephen Blum? Blum. Okay, Stephen Blum, who said he didn't start voice acting until 40. He looks great. He looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> when he said this, like, I didn't start voice acting until I was over 40. I'm like, wait, you're over 40? <laughs> yeah, and think about, like, how long ago Cowboy Bebop came out. Yeah, that was his first, like, that was his gig that, like, opened him up. And now he's everywhere. Even in 7-Eleven commercials? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so weird. 7-Eleven. <laughs> um, so what were, what were, what were some, uh, some bits that particularly stood out to you uh, in this documentary? The, the one that I, I thought about that, I did, again, I didn't really think about till later was legacy voices. Because it's, it's one of those things, because this voice acting is like, usually voice actors are around for apparently forever, but there's always a time where one either retires or they pass on. And so, and big companies like Warner Brothers and Disney who have very famous actor uh, characters with very famous voices to go along with them, they have to replace them. And that just, and, and it just never clicked in my mind. I was like, oh wow, that, yeah, they, re they replace them when they pass on. That's so weird, like to hear. And then to know that guys like uh, Jim Cummings doing, you know, took over for Pooh Bear and Tigger uh, a little bit later on is just like, you have to, you because it's now no longer, now it's no longer making a character. Now it's keeping that character alive and trying not to sort of change it too, too much. Because the first thing Jim says is that you have to sound like the guy, but then you have to kind of remember what the character is. And and I, <laughs> I feel so bad for Nolan North because Nolan North actually for the longest period of time was almost the new Mickey Mouse. Uh, he never got the job, unfortunately. Someone else got it. I still, I still can't see Nolan North doing Mickey Mouse. That, that just, mm, you know, but, you know. Then again, you look at some of these people and the voice that they do, you know, would you look at D. Bradley ba Baker and think that he could make those horrifying pig noises? We're going we're gonna to stay on that one for a while, aren't we? Um, I'm, I'm also more, I also <laughs> like the fact that Tara Strong is like, look, I'm a tiny girl. Now I'm a dude. Like, that was, I, I laugh at that scene every time. It's like, that's amazing. Do it again. I'm a child. Just do it again. <laughs> <laughs> It was like a magic trick. <laughs> <laughs> are getting you a, bit of a, a wizard? Get, get, getting, a, getting a bit of a crush there, are you, Brian? <laughs> She's good. What can I say? Who hasn't had a crush on Tara Strong? <laughs> Seriously, there's not a brony alive. But yeah, the, so yeah, but legacy voices, because like that one really sort of 
Because how many times, like, there's so many different voices now for so many different characters, but for, like, Disney, they always, they're, they're very strict on that. This has to sound like this character because it sounded like this character for 50 years. Like, that just seems like pressure on the voice actor beforehand. Um, and Bill Farmer is the voice of Goofy and Pluto, so he plays two dogs, which I always thought was hilarious. Who See, slept really his like way to the, the top. Uh, the scene where I can't remember... <laughs> <laughs> See, I really like I really like the the one guy. I can't remember his name, but he's t- he's breaking down like how to do Porky Pig voice, and then he does it. And he's like, and no one else can do it, and that's why I have job security. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was like yeah, the technique behind that, the eh, bit bit boy. Oh, I, I tried yeah. that. I tried that after the documentary. I couldn't do it. I could, I could do a word or two, but I can't. Yeah, I can't do the whole se- like when the sentence comes around, it's just me stuttering. Okay. <laughs> All right, what were some other noteworthy bits that uh, stood out to you? Pig noise hell. <laughs> we're not getting over that. You know, he no. does really amazing animal voices that aren't horrifying. True, and also, you know what, he, he also does, um, he's also on, uh, not Family Guy, what's the other one? American Dad, as the goldfish. Um, I don't even remember the goldfish's name, but it's German. Um, and the reason it's German is because Klaus. he's... Klaus. Yeah. He, the reason the, the fish is German, because the fish originally was supposed to be French. The reason the fish became German is because he said, I don't do French accent very well, but I know I'm fluent in German, so I can do German for you, and German probably going to be way funnier than, Fran- uh, than French. So he, they tried to change his mind. He's like, no, German's going to be funnier, and eventually they just hired him. So that's why the fish is French. Uh, not French, German. Huh. The more you know. Yeah. Interesting things that stood out in the documentary to me that weren't pig noise where um, I, I'd say high on the list has to be the bit where they talked about that um, web animation show where, um, uh, is it John DiMaggio? Or was it one of the other, one of the other male white voice actors plays a black guy in a cast of other black guys that just talks about shit online. That was, that the, was John DiMaggio and that's On the Curb I think you're talking about. On yeah, the but Curb, it, it, that it is was exactly star- what it, I'm talking about. It wasn't started by John, it was started by, I forget his name now, but Ro- Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life. See, I know the character and I forget the actor, I feel terrible. Well, you shouldn't, because that's apparently what they enjoy. <laughs> they, can, <laughs> they can go out on the street and not get mobbed. Yeah. yeah, but it was started by him. I know what you're talking about, because I've, I've honestly never seen it, though. Like, even after the documentary, I haven't seen it yet. Well, it was it was an interesting, interesting bits in, in which, you know, some of the voice actors displayed the versatility of, of what they can do, where, you know, that really helps that they can, you know, go out and not be noticed on the streets because when they're in character they can be completely unrecognizable I mean you know you know a a different kind of human or maybe not even a human at all the thing about that though especially the one on the on the curb is that it's it's the way they put it together is that it's improv like it's it's voice actors having fun basically at that point they're having conversation in these characters but there's no script um, I like how the one guy who was also on it, who also, I believe, voices Black Dynamite, um, said that to him, that's animated jazz. You know, just sitting down, having fun, and seeing what's sort of made. Like, how many real actors can say they can do that on, like, a movie set or something? They, they just, I'm going to sit down and act. Maybe on an improv show, maybe, but, you know, for voice actors, this is something they, they sort of do. And it looks like they have a blast sometimes. <laughs> In the recording booths. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's 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 another thing. I mean, this this documentary. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was mentioned. We had no idea the kind of equipment that they used. Thought it was more extensive. This gave us a more concrete look into inside the kind of space and tools they used to ply their trade. I'll tell you something that I I thought was really cool, just for nostalgia's sake, sake alone, is how many uh, people who did voices uh, from characters I loved when I was growing up. Uh, were involved in this, like Mark Hamill uh, talking about the Joker, or uh, I can't remember his name either. Brian, the guy who did Rocco, uh, who did Rocco and Rocco's Modern Carlos Life. Carlos something. <laughs> we'll get lots and, of corrections on this in the comments. Don't worry, and, it'll get uh, sorted out eventually. And I really like the compare, sort of the comparison uh, between uh, my, between Mark Hamill's Joker and I want to make sure I get the other guy's name Kevin right. Michael Kevin Michael Richardson. Richardson. Yeah, Kevin Michael, Kevin Michael Richardson's Joker. 
Um, and I love how, how, how Mark was a good sport. It's like, oh, no, Ke 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 Kevin's a good guy. He did a good joke. I was like, oh, yeah, that, that, that's cool. The, 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 the two big guys are, are, are being friends. He's jealous, oh. though, because Kevin got an Emmy nod and he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and that's, that's kind of interesting, too, is the, is the see sort of these actors is that not a single one of them looks like, you know, they kind of mention at the end how they, they have famous friends or like actor actors who get recognized and they, they usually don't unless they're in certain areas or certain, uh, in certain circles. And it's just sort of cool. Cause everyone's sort of, it's, it's a, everyone's in it for one another kind of situation. So that's, they're like, yeah, he has a really good Joker. He has a really good Joker. Or he has a really good Mike, uh, Mike Tyson. He has a really good Mike Tyson. Everyone thinks everyone is better at the job than what they are. But the fun fact is that they, like, they're all amazing. But no one ever wants to admit that they're amazing. They're like, no, he's better than me. No, she's better than me. Mike Tyson <laughs> off. They, uh, they, they were definitely on the spot by saying that uh, these aren't people with really big egos because if you had a big ego you wouldn't do voice acting you would be doing something else where you get a spotlight shown on you and uh, I think like that's 99% true because I could probably name a couple of exceptions in the anime industry <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> they're definitely like just the nicest people like most of the voice actors that I've worked with, even in the anime industry, are just the nicest people. They're not doing it for fame. They're not doing. They're certainly not doing it for money, because there's not a lot of money in it. Um, they're just doing it because it's something that they really enjoy, and that's that's a big deal, I think. What were some things that you were that you would have liked to have seen included in this uh, documentary that didn't that didn't quite make it in? I want to see ooh, more booth ooh, action. Me, me. Oh. Cat goes first. Booth action. <laughs> oh no! No, you can go ahead. I, I'll talk after. Well, I'll just say more, more in the. I mean, it's it's. You, you had some shots of people working inside the booths, um, and uh, just doing the voices. I kind of like seeing that as well. I like to see a little bit more of that. It's fun to see the people talk about it. I like to see them sort of show it, but at the same time, I kind of. I think it's because when you had to talk to them, they all talked to them like on the day off or when they were just you know, not working, which is apparently always, but <laughs> I'd like to see more of sort of, uh, like big sessions and things like that. That was, that was sort of my, uh, my little thing. And, and that's probably also because not everything that they do in the booth is probably that interesting. It's probably a lot of do that again, do that again, do like really repetitive kind of stuff. True. Except I was, I was, I, for some unknown reason, the whole pencil or finger in front of the mouth thing that John talked about. I don't know why, but I found that genius. I was like, "Oh, that's what you do <laughs> to get to get rid of um, the popping sound because it brushes the air away from the mic." I was like, "That's so simple." Yeah, that's... We should teach it to Doctor Gonzo because he pops his peas really hard. Yeah, yeah pea popper. <laughs> um, one of the things that I would have liked to have seen, and and I think it's just because of the, of the people who were making it, and I think I think the documentary must have been like maybe co-sponsored by Cartoon Network or something along the lines because I'm pretty sure I didn't see them really talk about any shows done on like by Nickelodeon and if, it, correct me if I'm wrong here guys but they mentioned Cartoon Network several times within the bounds of the show and they talked about a lot of like old shows or shows that have currently aired on or have previously aired on Cartoon Network but you didn't hear anything about Nickelodeon and well, they're, they're, um, and I, they're, maybe they talked about like Disney and stuff but I think he probably might have gotten go, a little go bit from it um, I will tell you though that I figured I remembered now is that, that that session we saw all four of them that was the last episodes of Madagascar's Penguins TV show which was on Nickelodeon oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so like one um, show, but I get what you're saying, and I remember thinking the same thing when I was sort of watching it, because you get clips yeah. from like uh, Futurama, uh, you got some clips from Adventure Time, you got you got clips from like uh, Star Wars, which was on uh, Cartoon Network for a while, not anymore. So, and a lot of this was done sort of out of pocket, and since he probably worked, because he works with Adventure Time, so he works sort of at Cartoon Network, he might have gotten permission, and he might have gotten. You know, I was like, yeah, sure, we'll help you out. Uh, make sure you show our stuff. Yeah. You know, so that, I don't I don't know for an absolute fact that that's true, 
but there it's very it's also it's also very obvious when you sort of watch it that they do talk about Cartoon Network way more than they talk about anyone else. Yeah, because one of the things that I thought was really odd was that um, Tara Strong was basically talking about the Rugrats and not about My Little Pony, which is what I think a lot of people know her for now. Um, and it was sort of like, why wouldn't you have mentioned a huge show like that? Because it's all done in Vancouver. And at the very beginning, they basically say, you need to live in LA because that's where every single voice acting job in the entire planet is. And I'm like, it actually, so why would they mention it's Vancouver? not. <laughs> um, but like Vancouver is, is its own thing. Like it's, it's a lot of stuff is, uh, is recorded there. Like a lot of transformers and a lot of other really great stuff is recorded in Vancouver. And there was of course no representation for any of those actors. And, most anime is recorded in Texas, but again, no representation of that because it's not something that you can, you know, that John DiMaggio can just throw together. Um, not going to fly out to Canada on his own dime. But, like, the fact that a lot of it, like, none of it was even mentioned. So I thought it was just a little, it was a little one-sided towards the, the L.A. Scene, whereas there there actually are voice acting opportunities in other places and with companies other than Cartoon Network, it it's just that you know, like they just didn't mention it. You know, also could be just be a lot of them. He he, lot, he li- I think he lives in L.A., so all these friends are in yeah, L.A. Yeah, well, so. I mean, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. But like, I was also a little like, hmm, D. Bradley Baker all up in this documentary. Never once at all did they mention um, Avatar or The Legend of Korra, which he plays every single freaking animal in that show. <laughs> and, it, and it's more than just disgusting pig noises. Like, he, he plays Appa and Momo and, and all of this other great stuff. And, like, you kind of see, like, part of a Legend of Korra poster in the background somewhere, but they never actually mention this gigantic, gigantic money-making franchise. <laughs> I wonder if we should uh, suggest a sequel. I know that voice too, but but spelled T O O. I'm clever. <laughs> hey, sometimes the simple humor works best. I know this is this was something that was made as a labor of love by John DiMaggio, so you know, it probably wouldn't have been anywhere near in the budget. But I would have liked to see you know a little more of the you know. As Brian said, you know, some of the process, I'd like to see some of the, the VAs go through what they go through, but then contrast it a little more with the finished work. We got some We got some of the bits in there. I mean, you, you see, we had clips from, from Adventure Time and from Gears of War and some other works in there, but not as many of them were, you know, say, directly connected to what was going on in the booth and in the pergo... The, preceding um the preceding screen time as i would have liked i mean it wasn't like we saw this one voice actor go through you know you know the 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 reading of the lines and you know changing it up on the fly and then we see you know for example marcus phoenix doing his speech all right i lied we did see that but i would have liked to see more like it i wouldn't mind seeing how big those video game scripts because I remember everyone's like video game scripts are like this or like this and like the pile looks like it's just getting bigger and bigger as each one talks about it I was like all right I want to see the size of these things I can tell you that uh video game scripts uh are massive nowadays there's a uh, when Mass Effect 3 was getting ready to come out there was a, a famous picture that went out over the web uh, shot by a Bioware employee of the script from Mass Effect 1 uh set next to the script from Mass Effect 3 and it was like sitting the Bible next to a pamphlet on summer camp. It was that big of a difference between the two. It's of them. not a script at that point. That's a tome. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then you know you, you think, oh well, there must be a lot of fucking lines in there. And then you know this is again something that I didn't think about until it was mentioned in the documentary. Every single noise and vocalization that could be made by the character in any situation has to be accounted for. So all those noises that, you know, your character makes when they take a hit, that's something that the voice actor's got to record. I mean, that 
you know, Commander Shepard's, you know, groan when he takes a bullet probably took like 45 minutes of recording time just on its own. That's why you schedule it. Because there's like 18 variations of it. Yeah. Yeah. And and people are. Sorry, I was just going to say that's just the um, that's just the sound effects. I mean, you know, ugh, ow, ah. There's there's you know the the inter battle banter like you know Commander Shepard could say my shields are down or lost shields or no shields or any permutation thereof. So it, it, it's like the 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 sheer scope of what needs to be done just on the scene by scene level boggles the mind. And that is why actors like video games, because it is a lot of work, and while it may eventually kill you, it does pay better than, say, like, anime. Because you're you're getting a lot of hours in the booth, and then, uh, presuming that it's a well-known video game, you're gonna make a little more money. Makes sense. Yeah, right, and that's that's something I would have liked to have seen, too. A little more of the, of the aspects of voice acting that aren't necessarily related to cartoon shows and movies. I mean, anime is, you know, your your specialty area here. And video games, those are both, you know, they're both, you know, voice acting domains in their own right that deserve, you know, that their own different look. That's just my opinion. I, I think I think actually there are plenty of documentaries about anime voice acting out there. You just they're not made by John DiMaggio is all. I tell you what, when I saw John DiMaggio's name attached to this project, I, 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 I put money down on them playing a clip from Gears of War, and I was not disappointed. <laughs> that's that's, a, that's <laughs> like, an easy I, bet. I'm pretty sure that's a one-to-one. I will yeah. bet a dollar, then you shall win a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was kind of surprised by the little joke at the end with having a, the CG bender come in and spray paint the end. You know, here's, yeah. here's you know, the funny story behind that is that the, that end, that that San Diego Comic Con like uh, pan over, that was the San Diego Comic Con I actually went to. Really? Yeah, that was the exact same one. Yeah, I tried very hard to get to like some of those areas where the voice er- voice actors were, but I being a being a first year San Diego Comic Con goer, I just got swept up in it. Um, but I did meet Phil Lamar on the uh, dealer room floor, which was very cool. He's a very he's a very cool, very nice guy. Like, and I know him. I was like, holy shit, Phil Lamar, Samurai Jack. He's like, hey, how you doing? Doing great. How are you? I'm fine. No, oh, I gotta catch you later. See you later. I was like, that was Phil Lamar. You know, I had stars in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> At least you didn't smack him with the bathroom door like I did Adam West. <laughs> Ooh. I'm not. I'm not going to so. touch that. <laughs> no, it, it it happened. I've told the story before. You'll have to go look right. for it. But yeah, yeah, it's 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 kind of funny. Like I, this is something that I feel like this is. This documentary or this this information, this is always like in the know, people. Like, yeah, this is stuff that we kind of knew, and we sort of kept secret. And I say we in terms of, like, I guess, geek culture or geek, yeah, nerd community. But I really feel like you know to get their proper respect, I, I would love to share you know this more with other one. That's why I sort of suggested it for the show to sort of spread out the news and whatever. And maybe we could get, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe we could get more. Uh, extensive versions in the future or something like that. Maybe someone else can kind of grab a hold of it. I w- I'll tell you this. Um, I did. I do have the DVD version of this. Um, the DVD version d- comes with like extended interviews and things like that. So there's actually even more sort of information or funny stories like Jim Cummins talking about the day um, uh, one of the voice actors fell asleep in the booth with them. Because <laughs> uh, who was it? Um... I forget who it was. It was a, it's a fam- it was a famous actress at the time. Um, Carol Channing might have been in. It might have been Carol Channing because uh, they were doing Rescue Rangers, and she didn't have her oh. part come up till much later. They're like, so you can you know wait. I'll oh, be fine. I'll be right here. So she laid down on the floor and fell asleep in the studio. Nice. <laughs> Epic. I tell you, I like the story that Kevin Conroy told about when he was uh, helping doing relief work after nine oh, eleven, really and somebody. And somebody recognized him as Batman and brought him out to do, I am vengeance, I am the knight, I am Batman, for all the relief workers in the cafeteria. I just like the fact that the best like, part. holy shit, he is Batman. The, the best part was them going, hey, everybody, this guy's Batman. Bullshit. <laughs> Make him prove it. <laughs> and then he does it and then he does it and he's like, so how does it feel to be Santa Claus? Because that's what you just oh. did. <laughs> That was a really, really good part. One of the one of the things that you can't do in, in this kind of voice acting versus anime acting, anime actors, because they go one at a time and not in groups, 
Um, and so they'll record like one character's lines and then they'll record another character's lines. Um, one of the things that these actors do that I, I'm cu- kind of curious if, if they have an ability to do it in American cartoons is that um, if somebody records bef- before somebody else and they know that other person is going to record soon, they'll drop bombs for them where they will like uh, leave a really ridiculously funny or inappropriate take that will get left on the track and until it's like final editing and uh, they'll leave it for whoever is going to be like the the next person to record so that they'll be doing their thing and they'll hear the other person's track and then they'll have to say something after they hear like the most ridiculous inappropriate funny thing i i don't know about (laughs) i do know that several voice actors do they have more fun messing with the sound guys um a couple of them are really good about doing like the dropout sounds and like, or like the board or the oh, microphone's yeah, yeah, yeah. not working, so it'll just drive the sound guys nuts. And this is just jokes for the voice actors. So I'm like, tee hee hee, look what we made them do. They're all panicking now. Look at them. <laughs> 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 all right, so um, we 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 one, one last bit of ground that uh, that we haven't really covered. There are, of course, a lot of voice actors uh, in this film. A lot of big names. Who are some names that you think were missed or that you would have liked to have seen included? I'm going to I'm gonna just go right now. I'm going to say I would have loved, I've already mentioned Frank Welker, but I would love to have seen Peter Cullen, uh, when, especially when you talk about legacy voices and talk about his reaction to other actors taking up Optimus Prime after, he, after, G, after the first Transformers cartoon ended. I would have loved to kind of hear his reaction to that uh, and being asked to come back for the films. I would love to just hear Peter Cullen talk about doing Optimus Prime and watching other people kind of take his baby for about 10 years. <laughs> um, I don't know. I would. Oh, go ahead, Kat. Sorry. I would like to have seen uh, Keith David. Um, he has just one of those magical, really distinctive voices. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's may, maybe his voice is just too damn distinctive. Um, but he's the guy who uh, plays um, a Goliath in Gargoyles. And I always used to get Keith David and uh, Kevin Michael Richardson. Richards? Richardson. Uh, w- Richardson. I, I can't ever remember. I used to get them confused because they, every time I heard them, they had like the kind of very deep, uh, kind of sexy black man voices, um, if, if, if I could say that in an inappropriate way. Um, um, and, but yeah, I felt like, man, you have somebody with such a distinctive voice. Man, I would have liked to have seen him. That would have been great. And, and then, of course, like more anime voice actors. But there isn't a whole lot of overlap there, so I totally get why. I, I would like to have seen... A lot of my favorite actors uh, were really in there, so I... I... I would like to see a little bit more maybe Corey Burton because Corey Burton has a very long, very long lineage of voices and um, and what he's done before. Uh, I think at one point in time, he's, I'm pretty sure he's just been on a show or on an episode of a show where it was just him talking to himself. That's how long the list of his credits are. Um, so I wouldn't mind his, like a little bit more time with him. But at the same time, there's probably a lot of repeat information that they had to cut. So they just... And they kind of just kind of choose, pick and choose who had the best answer or anything to that. Brendan, what about you? Uh, voice actor that you would like to have seen included? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I I guess I guess in in that regard, I stand by what I said earlier that I wish it had focused a little more on the categories of anime and game voice acting. And I wouldn't have minded seeing you know a few voices from you know from those categories that, you know, would make me stop, sit up, and say, holy crap, it's that guy, or that girl, or whatever. Just, I, I don't have anybody in particular in mind, so I, I guess that's just my catch-all answer. Right there. All right, so uh, this is I Know That Voice, uh, directed by John DiMaggio. And, uh, Brian, since you turned us on to this, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find this awesome film if they are so inclined to see it? If you are so inclined to see I Know That Voice, it can be found on iTunes and on also Amazon Instant Download. The DVD is available right now only on Amazon. Okay. So, uh, and uh, you got prices for these things? Um, not off the top of my head. Uh, I do know that the instant download, there's because there's, there's an SD version and an HD version. I do believe it goes somewhere between $7.99 and probably like $12.99. The DVD itself is probably $17.99 uh, as is. Um, and the iTunes is probably closer to the Amazon, so probably $9.99. These are all guesses, by the way, so no guarantees. It could be more, it could be less. 
Alrighty. Okay, but that's uh, I Know That Voice, directed by John DiMaggio. Uh, definitely very uh, informative uh, documentary, especially if you have any interest in uh, becoming a voice actor or in acting in general. Definitely worth checking out. So, uh, yeah, definitely look that up if you get the chance or if you are so inclined. And uh, that's all the time that we have for Nerd to the Third Power this week. And uh, thank you so much for tuning in. As always, I'm Dr. Gonzo. I'm the cat. I'm Brian. And I'm the Blast Seeker. All right, we'll see you next week. Taka, play us out. <laughs>